It is not an uncommon sentiment that life and death are intimately linked together. Speaking as a biologist, I would say this statement rings true on multiple levels. All around us, we see life fading into death, and death giving way for new life to arise. It may happen over centuries or even millennia. It may be as brief as a single season or even a fleeting moment. Regardless of the time scale, both life and death would seem to be bound together in a strange sort of unending dance. Immortality is rare among living things, and it tends to only happen under rather unusual circumstances. For example, a grove of aspen trees is in fact a single organism consisting of many deeply connected plants with a common origin. Such groves may persist for countless eons. However, each tree typically persists for no more than a century or two at most. Death is by far the more inevitable fate of life, whatever form it arrives in. Quite often, a corpse is left in the wake of such a demise. In the case of some trees, such remains might persist for hundreds of years, giving rise to miniature worlds built around their decaying forms. In the case of animals, a similar phenomena may occur, though the span of time is decidedly more brief. Among the natural undertakers that see to animal remains, one finds many species of insect. Some of these are familiar enough, as flies can nearly always be found accompanying corpses. Other species are somewhat less well known. The carrion beetles in the family Sylphidae are one such group. Many of these devour dead flesh with the same careless voracity as a typical maggot. However, there is one genus that is quite different, and this is the genus Necrophorus, sometimes known as sexton beetles. More commonly, they are known as burying beetles. The family Sylphidae is divided into two subfamilies. One of these subfamilies is the Nicrophorinae, which contains the genus Nicrophorus. The other subfamily is the Sylphinae. The beetles in this subfamily do not bury corpses, though they do feed on them. In fact, these particular sylphids are often quite important to forensic entomologists. They are part of the insect community that develops around and within decaying animal remains and human remains. A careful examination of such insect communities in the proper context of temperature and other environmental factors can provide fairly reliable estimates of the time of death. Such information can often be a critical part of criminal investigations. Returning to the beetles themselves, these creatures have a fairly distinct appearance. In general, the carrion beetles tend to be relatively large and often have a flattened sort of shape. Faded black and sickly hues of brown and yellow are not uncommon within this group. The antennae are relatively short and clubbed. The wing cases often have a rough, almost crinkled sort of texture to them, as though the beetle itself might have rotted just slightly. One clear example of this appearance is seen in Necrophila americana, the American carrion beetle. This species lives mainly on carcasses, though they have been known to visit stinkhorn mushrooms from time to time. Interestingly enough, the adult beetles and their larvae will often feed on the eggs and larvae of flies infesting the decaying flesh. Besides the obvious benefit of food, such actions also reduce the competition for their share of the carcass. The larvae of this species are surprisingly well-developed creatures, with distinctly visible legs and antennae. Overall, they resemble silverfish, though they are a bit more robust, and clad in glossy black armor. Really, it is little wonder that these armored creatures tend to make short work of the soft-bodied maggots they often encounter. The Nicrophorinae look somewhat different to their close cousins. To begin with, they are not nearly so flattened, though they are similarly large beetles. 
Instead of sickly yellow or brown, many species bear vibrant red or orange markings, standing out sharply against their otherwise black coloration. A few species are uniformly black, giving them a somewhat more funerary appearance. Their exoskeletons tend to be fairly shiny, though some species have quite fuzzy undersides. The name Nicrophorus may be roughly translated into Carrier of the Dead, or a Bearer of the Dead. This does have some accuracy insofar as these beetles move the corpses they find in the process of burying them. Actual carrying is relatively rare. The more common pattern is the simple excavation of dirt beneath the remains, and moving this dirt upward to cover said remains. The overall effect is a small corpse slowly sinking into the earth over several hours. To properly describe the habits of the Necrophorus, I would like to take the time to quote the works of an entomologist of some notoriety. Jean-Henri Fabre was a French naturalist who lived from 1823 to 1915. During that time, he made a great many observations of various insect fauna, and conducted a number of rather ingenious behavioral experiments. He wrote an appreciable number of books, and one of these was titled The Glowworm and Other Beetles. I will read a few paragraphs from an English translation of this particular work, detailing the habits of a typical burying beetle. Some other victim of the agricultural labors of the spring, a shrew mouse, field mouse, mole, frog, adder, or lizard, will provide us with the most vigorous and famous of these expurgators of the soil. This is the burying beetle, the necrophorus, so different from the cadaveric mob in dress and habits. In honor of his exalted functions, he exhales an odor of musk. He bears a red tuft at the tip of his antennae, his breast is covered with nankeen, and across his wing cases he wears a double-scalloped scarf of vermilion, an elegant, almost sumptuous costume, very superior to that of the others, but yet lugubrious as befits your undertaker's man. He is no anatomical dissector, cutting his subject open, carving its flesh with the scalpel of his mandibles. He is literally a gravedigger, a sexton. While the others, Sylphae, Dermestes, cellar beetles, gorge themselves with the exploited flesh without, of course, forgetting the interests of the family, he, a frugal eater, hardly touches his find on his own account. He buries it entire on the spot, in a cellar where the thing, duly ripened, will form the diet of his larvae. He buries it in order to establish his progeny. This hoarder of dead bodies, with his stiff and almost heavy movements, is astonishingly quick at storing away wreckage. In a shift of a few hours, a comparatively enormous animal, a mole for instance, disappears, engulfed by the earth. The others leave the dried, emptied carcass to the air, the sport of the winds for months on end. He, treating it as a whole, makes a clean job of things at once. No visible trace of his work remains but a tiny hillock, a burial mound, a tumulus. Clearly, Fabre was quite impressed with the little creatures, as he was with many such forms of life. More modern studies of the burying beetles have corroborated these observations and expanded upon them. Somewhat unusually among insects, the burying beetles most often work as mated pairs. That is, a male and female will bury a selected body together. While it is not unheard of for a female insect to take care of her offspring, it is extraordinarily rare for the male to participate in such care as well. Yet, among the burying beetles at least, this is usually the case. Both male and female remain with the remains, work together to process them, and tend to the developing brood of larvae. The degree of work put into each corpse is quite remarkable, particularly for a pair of beetles. Once the remains are underground within a small chamber, what might once have been a mouse or a small bird is broken down into a more usable form. The body's covering of hair or feathers is stripped away and sometimes used to line the chamber. The overall shape is processed down to that of a largely featureless spheroid with a cup-like depression in its upper surface. It is likely that the beetles produce various antimicrobial secretions to slow and control the processes of decay and putrefaction. 
However, the carcass is anything but fresh by this point, and it has been converted into something almost unrecognizable as a former animal. Though the aesthetics here are less than pleasant to human sensibilities, the decaying mass is now perfect for the beetle's purposes. This glob of rotting animal remains functions as both a cradle and a food supply for the larvae. They live quite happily in the cup-like depression, clustered together as they feed upon their surroundings. In addition, the adults will often partake of the available sustenance and regurgitate a somewhat more digested, liquefied version of the food to their offspring. The little grubs are known to beg for such feeding in a manner not unlike that of baby birds that might be found in a less gruesome sort of nest. With such attentive care, the larvae develop at a remarkable pace, often pupating within a couple of weeks of hatching. This is just as well as the parent beetles spend much of this time fighting off would-be invaders. After all, there are a great many creatures marauding about the soil that would love to take advantage of such a nicely prepared meal. The larvae leave the chamber to pupate somewhere in the surrounding soil and emerge as adult beetles after a week or two. Overall, the entire life cycle tends to happen within the span of a month. Despite the parental vigilance in their brood care, there is often a darker side to things. The beetles will sometimes cull their offspring. This is not a random act of cruelty, but rather a cold mathematical necessity. If too many larvae are present, the available food supply will not last through the duration of their development. There is no viable way to procure another corpse and transport it to the chamber. It is similarly impossible to safely transport the larvae to some newly excavated location. Thus, to prevent all of the offspring from starving, a portion of them are effectively sacrificed. Sometimes, the beetles sacrifice their lives as well. It is not unknown for one of the parents to perish in the act of defending the chamber from other would-be diners. Such is often the way of things in the insect world. Even setting aside the untimely demise of parents and children, there are other, less dramatic troubles that often assail these little beetles. One of the most common takes the form of mites, particularly those in the genus Pocillochirus. These little mites can often be found crawling on adult burying beetles. The beetles unwittingly and unwillingly carry these passengers between meals. Thankfully, the mites do not feed directly on the beetles themselves. However, they do feed on carrion and effectively steal resources from the burying beetles. These particular mites pass through a few developmental stages as they feed on corpses. The eggs hatch into larvae, which have six legs in contrast to the eight legs of other stages. These molt into eight-legged protonymphs, which in turn eventually molt into deuteronymphs, sometimes also known as deuteronymphs. It is this stage that clambers onto the beetles to be carried to their next feeding ground. At the next corpse, the deuteronymphs molt into adult mites. Having reached maturity, they mate and lay eggs to begin a new generation of phoretic parasites. It may be worth noting that there is at least some degree of species specificity in such parasitism. That is, a given species of mite will prefer to parasitize a given species of burying beetle. It is also worth noting that related Pocillochirus mites also tend to accompany the carrion beetles in the Sylphony subfamily. However, the relationship here is somewhat more mutually beneficial. To begin with, there is more food to go around in the case of the larger corpses the carrion beetles tend to frequent. Thus, a few additional diners are not quite as troublesome as they are for the burying beetles. The mites also appear to help in the devouring of competing fly larvae, thus providing a somewhat macabre service to the beetles. Returning to the burying beetles. Despite their various difficulties, they tend to manage well enough overall. That being said, there are some species, such as Nicrophorus americanus, that are currently listed as endangered. A pity, as there is much about these little beetles that might be regarded as laudable and even inspiring. Despite their grisly way of life, the burying beetles are veritable embodiments of diligence and cooperation. They are almost unique among the insects in the extent of their brood care and the presence of both a mother and a father throughout the development of the offspring. 
Even their rather noxious dietary habits are in fact providing a vital service in nature, removing corpses to make room for new life. Macabre though it may be, there is something quite endearing about the little grave diggers, as they make each grave into a home. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have enjoyed today's little foray into the unknown. If you are still curious and wish to venture a little further, here are a few things you might consider looking into. If you found this video enjoyable, do feel free to leave a like. If you believe others might enjoy it, by all means, share. If you wish to see more of this channel, a subscription should prove quite helpful. Until next time.